Hi guys, it's Geekonomics here. And so we've been looking in class recently about the whole notion of economic systems. Now I think, and it's certainly a possibility, especially for those of you doing the F585 uh, final reset exam, that you may get some type of essay question with regard to the difference between, or the advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons, between a free market economy and the command or planned economic system. So I thought in this little video I will just run through quite quickly some of the characteristics of each of these and discuss some of the advantages and also disadvantages of them all. So before we get started let's not forget the three main things that any economic system is attempting to answer. Three key questions are number one what goods to produce and in what quantities? Number two, how should the various goods and services be produced? And number three, for whom should the various goods and services be produced? And you'll know that there is a spectrum of economic system ranging from the free market where it's all allocation of resources is done by the market forces of demand and supply then we have the command economy, the planned economic system, where everything is owned and controlled by the state, and the state really does determine everything. So, let's consider about the market economy, what goods are produced and in what quantities. Well, of course, that is all determined by our old friend, we'll talk about this a little bit later, that's determined by the market mechanism, or the price mechanism, so-called, which is, of course, our simple, demand and supply diagram and it is the interaction of demand and supply which determines which goods are produced and in what quantities and indeed we also talk about the fact that the consumer is sovereign in other words the consumer has control over the resources because when the consumer increases demand in a free market system more resources are allocated to that product and hence output goes up as a consequence so if we just were to consider that very briefly, demand curve would shift right to D2. That obviously forces the price up as a consequence. Now, outsiders looking into this market, they will see the prices have gone up. They will see that there is an abnormal profit-making opportunity, and they will enter the market. Now, why can they enter the market? They can enter the market because there are no barriers to entry in a free market system. So they enter the market, supply curve shifts to the right to S2, and hence you get this movement from Q1 to Q2. You'll be familiar with this diagram for the price or market mechanism. How are the various goods and services produced? Well, in the free market system, we talk about the fact that there is a lot of self-interest. We talk about the fact that there is a lot of competition. Now, in order to make a living and in order to make a profit, if you are a self-interested individual, profit may not be the only motive for being in business, but if you are self-interested, you will be forcing costs down as far as possible in order to maximise your own profits. And so, how are the goods and services produced? They are produced at the lowest cost and with the greatest amount of efficiency, meaning that the markup between cost and price is at its maximum, hence maximising profitable returns. And then finally, for whom? Well, in a free market system, the people with the most money and the most wealth will have the most say about this diagram here, the allocation of resources because it is those people who will be able to drive demand up in specific areas and hence to a certain extent dictate where resources are allocated and hence which goods and services are produced. Now of course whether or not that is fair and equitable and the whole notion of equity as you know is something which is rather contentious with the free market system that is another question ladies and gentlemen but in terms of answering the question for whom it is those people who have the greatest say and those people are the uh, wealthiest so they will be driving resources in particular product areas those products being the products that they want okay so those are the three questions 
Of course, in a command or planned economic system, not that we've got many of these left in the world, but um, obviously we've got economies which are transitioning. Uh, so by that we mean that they are they were command economic systems. Now they're moving, they're opening up to the free market. So if you think about China, for example, moving and opening up. Think about Cuba, especially those of you who are doing your pre-release on F585. Obviously these last two extracts all on Cuba about an economy in transition, attempting to embrace market forces whilst at the same time doing it slowly and still maintaining that state and government regulation. Whether or not you are classed as a command or free market, there'd be very few which will be outright, of course, on the extremes, but most will be somewhere in between. Some will have a combination of state intervention, so think of our own economy, state provided goods and services, health, education, defence, transport, all of these hot topics, all very much hot potatoes, ladies and gentlemen, in the election at the moment. So the degree of mixing depends upon the degree of government intervention. So if you've got a very mixed economy, lots of state intervention, like the French economy, for example, we're talking about moving in this direction, more towards the command system. If it's very open, the land, well, I, I say this in uh, reflected on it in hindsight, obviously, now that uh, President Trump is in power, but obviously one would talk about the USA as the land of the free and so on. Um, and so, therefore, less state and government intervention. Okay, so, having established these things, ladies and gentlemen, now let us consider some of the characteristics of the free market economies, and I've noted some of them here for you. So I'll very quickly just mention each in turn. Private property, what does this mean? Well, this means that individuals in a free market economy, are, uh, they are actually allowed to own and control resources is primarily what it means. Now, if you were in the command economic system where resources are owned and controlled by the state, that's an absolute no-no. But in the free market system, you are. So most of you will want to own your own home, I'm sure. And it was talking on Radio 4 this morning, they were talking about um, the fact that people in their old age, in their dotage, have to now release equity from their homes in order to fund their care when they are in their uh, 70s, 80s, 90s and so on and so forth. So lots of people want to own their own homes uh, primarily to pass on to their children of course and you're allowed to do that in a free market economy. Freedom of choice and freedom of enterprise. If you want to be a teacher or a doctor or a nurse or a solicitor and the list goes on you are perfectly entitled to pursue a career in your chosen field. So you have the choice to do that. If you want to start your own business, if you want to organise some land, some labour, some capital, and you as the entrepreneur, you have the idea, you're quite at liberty to organise these resources for production and to enter a particular market, a particular industry. And you're allowed to do that in the free market economy. In the planned or command economy, I think back to my A-level studies uh, where we were considering the writings of Heinrich Böll. And Heinrich Böll was writing in the 1940s and 50s and he was talking about uh, the job that he was doing and the particular little short story is called Die Postkarte. And he's talking about the fact that everybody in the FDR, the Federal Democratic Republic of Germany at the time, they did have jobs, but they were jobs that really had no meaning. They were jobs for a job's sake, not particularly motivating or satisfying. And the same goes if you go to countries like Cuba, for example, you'll still find people there, highly qualified people indeed, who are doing rather low paid, low skilled jobs because that freedom of choice, that freedom of enterprise is not open to you in this planned or command economic system. Self-interest. We inherently, by human nature, we are self-interested. We are interested in self, we are interested in income, we are interested in profit. We, there is that sort of mentality of, well, I'll, I'll step on my neighbour in order to better myself. Now that, of course, we would not condone that, 
but that is a, that is um, in its most what's the word to describe that you know it's its most uh, awful representation really that is self interest at its worst but it does mean that people progress it does mean that people innovate it does mean that people um, go for promotion and all of those types of things so that there is a certain a positive aspect to that as well. Competition. Of course there'll be competition because it's freedom of enterprise and freedom of choice. We're all at liberty to compete in our own chosen field. Be that in education or be that in the private sector. That can happen. Price and consumer sovereignty. We've talked about the consumer being sovereign with regard to the uh, market mechanism diagram. Price, don't forget, also is, acts as a rationing device. So, in the past, where we had barter systems, of course, and we needed a double coincidence of wants in order for trade to take place, well, now you can trade and you can purchase items, but obviously, you need to be able to afford the price. And as price rises, then that puts certain goods out of the reach of some people, and as a consequence, that is why we refer to the fact that price is a rationing device. Now, if you think then about the planned or command economic system, I remember when I was doing my A-level economics in the early 1990s, and my teacher, uh, Derek, at the time, he used to constantly be handing out articles about uh, the opening up of the former Soviet Republic. And it was a, an economy in transition. However, as a planned or command economy, Goods were rationed, not by price, but goods were rationed by people having to queue endlessly for goods. And if you got to the front of the queue and there were none left, I'm afraid that was it. That was just pure hard lines. So that, of course, is a very inequitable uh, way to allocate goods and services. Also, um, because the demand in a planned economy would very often outstrip supply, then maximum prices had to be imposed on goods in order that they were available and affordable, more to the point at all. Remember your maximum price diagram is where the P max here is beneath the equilibrium. Price mechanism we've talked about for resource allocation, totally different in the planned economy and the command economy. How are resources allocated? Well, I, as the central governing authority, will determine which goods and services are produced. I will determine uh, where you go to school. I will determine what job you do. I will determine um, where you live. I will determine how much money goes into health, education, etc. Now, of course, the one thing about, and you'd have to say this is a positive point for Cuba, particularly, uh, obviously Castro uh, passed away not so long ago, and um, reading some very interesting articles from the Sunday Times, but you'll know, I'm sure, from your studies of planned and command economies, yes, there are, all of these things don't apply. However, there are some benefits, of course, to this uh, planned or command system in that everybody does have something to do because they do have a job. Everybody does have some shelter. And from the late 1950s in Cuba, they pumped endless amounts of money into the education system. So the education system was very, very good indeed. And as a consequence of that, you will go to Cuba and you will find the people who are waiters, waitresses, doing relatively low skilled work, but they are very skilled in terms of their education. So they're very highly educated individuals. So they are doctors, nurses, lawyers, etc., etc. Now, one might describe that, of course, as a little bit of a misallocation of resources. And, of course, part of that is because this whole notion of the price mechanism is not being allowed to function properly. So, I guess most economies, therefore, choose to land themselves somewhere in the middle here. Because, not only do you benefit from all of these things, but it also comes with the safety net of some government intervention. So the safety net in terms of the fact that um, if you're made redundant or you lose your job, then there's some unemployment benefit there for you. 
if for instance you are unwell and you need treatment and you don't have a job or you've got a relatively low paid job you can still find that treatment somewhere and it'll be provided for you so state provision of goods and services being very very important indeed so ladies and gentlemen I'd like to, I think, wrap it up at that. I said this would be brief. I don't think it's been that brief in the end. But um, I think that this is a potential area for certainly for extract 4 or 5 on the F585. Uh, and potentially for those of you in year 12 doing the new spec. Who knows? Hasn't come up before. Might do this time. Bye for now.